Hey everyone, Connor here from CameraStore.com, here with Nico again for another round of our Q&A. Uh, as usual, we're going to collect questions from Instagram, YouTube, wherever the we're on socials. Uh, you can leave us questions and we'll answer them here in video form. So leave a comment below if you have any questions about cameras, film, our store, what we do here. Uh, or follow us on Instagram and participate in the live Q&A there. Uh, let's get started. Okay, this uh, time we have a question from, I'm going to say Aziz. Uh, is the Canon new F1 a hybrid, hybrid mechanical shutter? Mine doesn't work without a battery inside. You have a Canon, so you can answer this better than <laughs> I have an old F1, which is a uh, fully mechanical camera. The new F1 is a hybrid electromechanical system. It should work mostly without a battery. Uh, the fast shutter speed should work without a battery. If it's not working without a battery, there's probably something wrong somewhere in the camera. Um, and I would also assume that you're, with battery, it's probably not working per perfectly either. Um, so I would suggest you bring it to somebody who's a professional that can check it out tell you what's wrong with it yeah I mean if the battery if the battery is uh, managing some shutter speeds mm. then like you said it should be working in some others and there's sort of hybrid <laughs> ones yeah it's this kind of thing where when the battery is in the camera the battery governs every shutter speed oh, okay and then when there's no battery it can do faster speeds I've never used and I'm not a yeah. mechanic so this is why we're answering like yeah. this. we should probably have a, ask some wow. mechanics to also fill this on with this but yeah, it's, uh, a, it's a complicated camera internally. Yeah, but yeah, get it checked out. Yeah, and you can also do a roll, like shooting different settings in a roll. So one thing that's very good to test the roll and how your camera is performing is doing the the like the um, matching of shutter speed and aperture mm -hmm. throughout the whole range to match like basically good exposure, mm -hmm. and then develop. Uh, maybe just a gray background, a white background, something very uh, the same color all the time. And then you can see the negatives on a light table. And if there's differences in density, you will tell if yeah. there's a problem yeah. with the shutter speed being off, being overexposure, underexposure. This is a way to test a camera without shutter testing mm -hmm. equipment, mm -hmm. per se. So we can actually probably even make an article on how to do that because it's yeah. kind of That's sounds weirder than it is makes a lot of sense when you do it, yeah. and it makes a lot of sense when you see the negatives and they're completely... Yeah, it sounds you know, complicated, but really it's not. Yeah. It's a pretty simple thing, and the, yeah. it's a good idea. Yeah. We should make an article about that. Maybe we will. Bonnie, nineteen eighty-seven seventy-eight. Why are all cine movie cameras listed as not, te not tested on your website, and will you ever sell movie film? Um, the simplest reason for that is that they aren't tested. Um, we have very specific testing equipment for stills cameras, and you need a whole different set of equipment for movie cameras. And I just, it, based on what I know, that's just not a big enough market segment for us to go find those testing machines if they even exist anymore. They're um, complicated for sure. Yeah. So we don't have those, equip those machines, and um, part of our not tested label or not passed label is if something is untested. Yeah. So by default, they go to untested. Yeah. Um, when we have the not passed, it, it, like we explained earlier in the Q&A here, it's that we can't test it sometimes, either because the film doesn't exist anymore, like maybe APS cameras or 110 cameras, which we do have testing for, for the shutters on most of those. Yeah. But uh, cinema or movie cameras have very specific testing, like Connor said, but also something somebody told me at Photopia Fair last year in Hamburg is that every cinema camera has a different diffraction from the viewfinder. So if you're able to see the image through the lens, the prism has like a, an amount of light it captures, so it would lose light, and the camera mm -hmm. knows how to compensate that, but the shutter tester, you have to kind of put it in. And I'm talking about something somebody told me, I'm not sure if it's accurate, mm -hmm. but he said, Basically, the conclusion this person that buys services and sells movie cameras is pretty much, it's almost impossible to know for sure if they're fully working properly. So to not have any risks ourselves and to push like you as buyers to be able to get a good deal and maybe it works fine, we just sell them as, hey, they're not tested, not passed. Yeah. You take the risk, you buy some film, shoot it, and if it comes out good, great. If it doesn't, well, 
we couldn't tell you it was not working, so we can't really mm -hmm. do that. We do obviously test like if it doesn't turn on, yeah. does it move, does it make sound, all those usual easy tests. Yeah. But we can't tell you is the shutter speed 1 50th or is the shutter angle uh, 1 80th, but we try. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that even if it says untested, I think we, we try to be careful about what we say. Normally it is, you know, we put batteries in it, we see if it, the motor winds up, we see if it sounds okay. I mean, because sometimes you turn on a motor and it's like immediately, oh, that's not how that should sound. Yeah. Um, we do do that. So that's sort of the level of testing that you probably see all over the place. Yeah. Um, we just can't test it for accuracy the way that we do with stills cameras. Yeah. And the second part of the question was, will you ever sell movie film? We don't, mostly because people don't ask for it, yeah, and it will expire because film does have an expire date. The, here in Finland, there's Mutascan in Helsinki that does a pretty good job at stocking, you know, double X, 250D, 500T, yeah, and they have usually 16 mil, 8 mil, uh, 35 mil, and you can buy it from them. Um, so I recommend you vis visit their website if you want some of that. And if not, locally, you probably can find, and like I know the Netherlands, Germany, Spain, every country has some major motion picture uh, reseller of stock. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we won't start selling it anytime soon. Yeah, um, just a small market. Yeah. Uh, then we have Alex Caffey. Can I send in a camera to be serviced and checked on your calibrators? And we also got a second question from at Lucan Logs, Lincoln Logs was a toy I played with growing up. Um, I don't know if that's what it is, but that's whatever. That's you chose the question. <laughs> you did, just because you had a fun name. Will <laughs> you ever start doing repairs? So those are related. Um, we do repairs every day. We do, re yes, we do repairs every day. Uh, our mechanics work full time. We have five, six, six. now? Six, six mechanics now working full time repairing cameras. The issue is that we have 6,000 cameras of our own in the basement. Um, so our priority, um, is to repair those. It's, you know, a bit simpler for us logistically and more profitable for the most part. Um, so we have to keep the lights on somehow. So repairing customer cameras is something that obviously we've considered and something that people have asked for quite a lot, but it's not something we feel that we are maybe capable of doing right now. Um, so... Yeah, probably there's, not. <laughs> yeah, probably not. No, we probably won't do it anytime soon. Like Connor said, basically out of 100 cameras that we purchase in a given time, a very big percentage needs repairs. And not always like fully needs repairs, but it's one of those like some systems that we're like, well, we know it's working okay now, but let's service it to give it, you know, years of use in your hands. Yeah. And in that case, Hasselblad's, Mamiya RBs, Mamiya RZs, uh, Roly flexes, stuff like that is getting serviced and more like a CLA than a, hey, it's completely broken, let's put it back together. Mm. And this is why we have such a big queue, lenses, things like that, we are continuously repairing. So because of that big volume of stuff that we either service because it's broken or service because it will then have like a lifespan that will be years into the future, because we want cameras to be working for years to be. We don't want to just buy a camera, sell a camera, you get it, it works for two rolls, oh, tough luck, it broke. Mm -hmm. We want them to work. Because if it does break, break, and this happens with Hasselbuds and all these professional cameras, then the repair is not like a couple hours. It could take days or even not be possible. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're doing more like a advanced repair service before or just a car, like a car service than a broken thing service. And for that reason, making repairs for others is not easy. Our recommendation has usually been, you can sell us your camera if it needs service, and we will pay you as it needs service, which is obviously a fraction of the selling cost. And then you can buy like a trade or buy a working camera from us. And then, you know, it will cost obviously a one-to-one, -one, but you kind of like subsidize, like, uh, you know, the new camera that you're getting that works accurately. Obviously, some people have sentimental value. It can be a family camera. Yeah. Then we can't do much. Uh, yeah. Recommend find a service that can do it for you. Yeah, it's a tough. It's a tough spot to be in. I mean, I will say with a lot of, especially the popular SLRs, if you were to buy an unserviced one and then pay to have someone service it, it's probably around the same price as buying one that's already been serviced by us. Yeah. Um, not going to be that much different. No. So, yeah. But yeah, that's basically the answer for now. We have thought about slots with high-end stuff like Hasselblad's. 
but then our mechanics also you have to think that when they're doing customer camera they have to fix the camera in their hands sometimes when they're doing repairs something goes wrong the screwdriver accidentally goes through the shutter blade or something like that uh, and there is where having our own cameras makes them work more comfortably as in if it's a camera of a customer you have that weight of like what happens if i break something do i have a donor do we not yeah so for now it's a no-go for repairs Zhang Wang 2000, no, 207. Best suggestion for overcoming winter depression? I don't know if Connor can answer that. I think he's finding the answer still. I would say uh, basically usually taking your holiday if you can during winter is really helpful. Like leaving for a little <laughs> bit. Basically leave winter. I, I was in, in the U.S. Be my advice too, yes, you were in the U.S. for Christmas. I was in the U.S. for Christmas. You were in the snowy part. I was in the snowy yeah. We part. did actually have snow. Which, it was actually really nice, but we had sun as well, and that's yeah. I think the bigger thing. Um, yeah. Usually, knowing summer's coming <laughs> helps to overcome winter depression. Uh, having some sort of hobby indoors that you can do at any time also is really good. I highly recommend the dark room as a great place because the dark room is exactly that. It's a dark room where you can enjoy. Developing film, printing film, scanning film, organizing your film. You've been doing that during winter where you get your negatives and you cut them and sleeve them. And it's kind of like almost therape uh, therapeutic. Oh, it's, it's really like, nice. Yeah. yeah. So stuff like that. And then maybe during winter, you can also refine your collection of cameras, choose what you're going to shoot, prep a trip. Like it's always good to be looking forward to something. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly come from a place where the weather wasn't so much better than here. And Finland, so I'm actually not that bad with winter, but I understand that they, it ends up getting long and the lack of light is something that's taxing. But yeah, I recommend if you can take a trip and then if you can't have some hobby that you don't mind the weather and the winter. And vitamin D supplements. Yeah, eat healthy <laughs> during winter, it helps. Um, no, but even if you don't, I mean, you're just not getting the sunlight, and that's where you would normally get the, that vitamin D from. We have the. Amaranth yeah, we have a light. gigantic light here, but that's. Fake sun. Yeah. Um, the depression land. Yes. <laughs> okay, we have a good question here. Yeah. Uvik Peck, how do I get job? Connor wrote this down so Connor can answer. <laughs> well, the, the, <laughs> I, look, look, I'm assuming he means a job with us because it's related to us. Yes, yes. Um, and I can answer that genuinely. Um, when we have openings, be that in the technician school or otherwise, uh, we'll post about it quite a lot, um, you know, because we want everybody to be able to see it. We'll post on Instagram. We'll post to, to a local job board if you're local. Sometimes our newsletter even. Yeah, to our email list. So it's a good idea to subscribe to that. Um, and you'll apply, basically. <laughs> you'll, you'll fill in your information, send us a resume. If we think you'd be a good fit, we'll talk to you and, and interview you. and Ship you over sometimes. Yeah, ship you over, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, and this is an interesting question because I am based in Spain, born in Spain in Spanish, and I got offered a job to move here. You're from the U.S., got offered basically a summer kind of internship job thing, whatever that it became, and you ended yep. up staying here. Mm -hmm. So it is very possible to end up here from a different country. Uh, as long as your English is pretty decent, you're fine. Yeah. Finnish is not necessary in our daily uh, job. Obviously, customer service and some other tasks do need Finnish, but it's not mandatory for everybody. And um, yeah, obviously, if you're from Europe, it's much easier for paperwork. If you're from outside of Europe, uh, like currently the UK, the US, or any other country, then we really have to have a good reason to bring you in. Connor, for example, had a very excellent reputation for working camera stores and writing articles and content for photography, which is not always so easy to find. So he started by that, and now he's the <laughs> listing team leader. Yeah. So like, you yeah. never know where you're going to end up in this company. Um, it's I came, part of the beauty of it, I yeah, think. I came We're like, here for yeah. content and now run operations. Like That's something that happens. So it's a very good company in the sense that you can get a job, not being local, but it's not super easy. Every time we make a job opening, we have hundreds and hundreds of people, and that's there's true. very good resumes. So. Yeah. Uh, you can keep trying. Uh, learning camera repairs on your own and trying to find a job here is usually the r worst route you can take. Um, you're better off maybe just liking camera systems, understanding camera systems and things like yeah. that, like the taxonomy of cameras yeah. and learning how they operate in a sense um, that might get you here and then having good discipline for work and things like that. But, yeah, that would be my sort of similar to what you said. 
Um, my advice in general, if you're trying to find a job here or otherwise, I guess, is to one, maybe have a bit of a specialty, but beyond that, to try to know a little bit about a lot of things. So you can have one or two topics that you really dive deep on, but then it's good to also be flexible in that sense, that if someone asks you a question that's not about your specialty, you can still answer it with confidence and knowledge. Or you know how to research if you need to. Yeah. But for example, when we have had, when we have hired people here recently, we've had, um, we have a list of systems on the job application. And I remember when I filled it out, the first one is Altix. <laughs> and I remember like reading it and being like, what the hell is Altix? And I've talked to plenty of people that have applied since then, and they all were like, what the hell is Altix? But once I got here, or even right after I filled it out, I was like, what the hell is Altix in Google? And I learned what Altix is. And now like, I spot mistakes that people make with Altix because I know the system. Yeah. And you it's that kind of, here. yeah, it's, it's that kind of like, I think flexibility and thirst for knowledge, I guess, that we really need and benefit from here. So you never know. Okay, we have the last question, Isaac Amboage. Uh, do you lose image quality or other features when adapting lenses from one system to another? For example, FD lenses on EF cameras. Well, the example is exactly a yes, probably you lose. Yeah, no. This is, he, he sent a message, this is a, he was specifically asking about using a, an adapter with glass in it, which you have to, to mount FD lenses on uh, EF bodies, both Canon, but an older system mounted to the newer system. Due to flange distance. Yeah. For that to work, the, the adapter needs some sort of optical element to correct for the flange distance, which, if you're not familiar, is the distance that the lens needs to be from the film to achieve proper focus. That's different for every single system, so it's different for Nikon than it is for Minolta, than it is for Canon, than it is for Nikon again. Uh, <laughs> it's different for everything. Um, and that causes problems. That's why you see adapters that are different sizes, that are thicker or thinner. Some of them are basically just rings. Some of them are quite thick. Um, yeah, you, you will lose a little bit of optical quality. It's pretty minor, all things considered, if you get a good adapter. Um, in terms of features, you'll lose automatic aperture control, autofocus, if it exists. Um, a lot of stuff, kind of. <laughs> That, yeah, yeah, maybe I mean, it, it's, it makes it hard. I think adapting film SLR lenses to another film camera is kind of maybe more trouble than it's worth. Um, adapting to a digital system has a lot more um, possibilities and features that can help you. Yeah, I think, I mean, adapting lenses, like Connor was explaining, from flange distance to another flange distance that has just space shouldn't affect quality. The lens should render how it rendered on another camera. Yeah. The moment you introduce glass elements, then is when that glass element is adding, it's like adding a filter on the front of the lens. Mm. Theoretically, you are modifying the quality of the lens by adding a filter because there's more glass, more internal reflections, more things like that. So that can affect. But if you're mounting, for example, Nikon F can be adapted to Canon uh, EOS uh, without any glass. That 50 mil Nikon on a film EOS is going to be the same as on a like Nikon body, mm -hmm. basically. It should be the same, except for the loss of features like Connor was mentioning. Yeah. But the moment you add glass of any kind, then there's an option to be altered. There are very good adapters. And like you said, the money does talk in this case, where yeah. the better adapter will have better uh, glass yeah. features and like the glass is better. But it will affect in that case. Is it worth it? I mean, you were saying maybe not for film. I kind of agree-ish with that. Yeah. But when you're shooting video like we're shooting now, uh, or you're like shooting digital with a mirrorless, it's so much fun to adapt. Yeah, definitely. And you can use all kinds of lenses that give, like we were talking about earlier, the more character, more of a vintage look than the sharpness of a Sigma or, yeah. you know, some crazy new lenses. But I, I think it's fun and I like doing it all the time for video especially but for cameras that shoot film I mean I adapt LTM to M but that's like a to like a, and the lens doesn't lose any features yeah but if you add glass you do lose probably a little bit of quality yeah is it gonna affect your results in a way that is significant probably not yeah. and your pictures will be as good or bad 
without the adapter or with the adapter, it's rare that you'll notice <laughs> a lot of difference and be like, wow, that's maybe a duplicator will be the worst case scenario because that's not really adapting, but you're doing like a teleconverter. Like a teleconverter, mm -hmm. yeah. Those I was I was going to say we have a, a good example of a modern one that really doesn't affect image quality is the the speed boosters. Yeah. That you would use on Micro Four Thirds or APS that um, sort of widen the field of view to match a lens's native field of view that yeah. on full frame. Yeah. Um, those are pretty cool. A similar ish concept, but not quite the same thing. Yeah. But it does add, like we said, those yeah. reflections, sometimes ghosting, weird, like, uh, how do you call it, when the light goes in and you see the little flares and all mm -hmm. that stuff. But yeah, it can affect, uh, and I recommend you test it out. I have a lot of fun testing things out. Obviously, we worked in camera heaven, so we can do whatever uh, work or after work. But yeah, it will affect in one way. Yeah, that's all the questions we have for this week. Um, like I said before, if you have any follow-ups or anything else on your mind, leave a comment below or follow us on Instagram at camerastore.com and we'll answer them next time. So thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I've been Connor here with Nico. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.